Okay, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Amina Shakir, and we want to welcome to you to the College of Education's Living Learning Community Alumni Speaker Series. This is our first series of the fall semester uh, in the COVID context, right? COVID contemplatives. Uh, we are today having Dr. Christopher Daniels to talk about leadership and innovation in education. Um, Dr. Daniels is an esteemed alumni of the College of Education, which was established in 1887. Um, and we have a brief agenda here. Uh, this program will run for the total of an hour uh, from 4.30 to 5.30. Um, my name is Dr. Amina Shakir. I am the director of the Candidate Empowerment Center in the College of Education, as well as as liaison for the living learning community here in the College of Education. So we want to welcome all of you today. A special welcome to Dr. Daniels, also to Mr. Moyes for bringing his EDG 1072 College Success and Beyond class. Uh, so we will now have a brief introduction uh, of Dr. Daniels given by uh, one of our fall 2019 cohort LLC members uh, who maintained a 4.0 GPA for the entire year never get tired of saying that, Ms. Sydney Offord. Hello everyone, my name is Sydney Offord. I'm a second year elementary education scholar from the 301 DMV and I'm here to introduce Dr. Daniels today. So Dr. Daniels is a green owned scholar in the field of African Africana studies. He has written numerous books, articles, and given lectures in several countries around the world. He is a graduate of FAMU's, Co FAMU's College of Education, and he received his PhD from Howard University. Thank you very much, Ms. Offert, for that brief introduction. Of course, Dr. Daniels has many more accomplishments. This is a brief highlight reel, and I'm sure he will tell you much more about some of the things that he's doing currently in the areas of innovation as it relates to his training and education. I will stop sharing here, and Dr. Daniels, you can share your screen. Okay, um, th thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's always great to speak to people in the College of Education. You know, as, as, as was said, I'm an alum of the College of Education. Both my parents are teachers. My mom taught for 40 years. My dad taught for about 37 years. So teaching, teaching is something that's always been in my blood for a long time. So I really always enjoy every time I get an opportunity to get a chance to speak to future educators. In particular, in times like now, right? So we are seeing, you know, our field of education is being rapidly transformed. A lot of things are changing. Maybe some of them will be permanent. Maybe some of them are temporary. We don't know, right? However, one thing that we do know is that leadership and innovation at this time in our history are very, 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 very critical, right? So what, what I'm gonna do is basically just kind of, you know, speak for a few minutes, uh, go through a couple of key slides. Um, if someone has a question, maybe they can put it in the chat or if not, you know, we'll just have a general kind of question and answer session at the end. Uh, I know it's always it's always a little bit awkward, you know, doing things on Zoom with people asking questions and back and forth. But if you do have a question or something that you want to ask me, um, just put it in the chat and then maybe we'll cover them all at the end. Or if it's something pressing, then we can just cover it. I can just stop and cover it kind of right away as I go through the, as I go through the presentation. All right. So, again, my presentation is leadership and innovation in education. So leadership is a combination of measurable and unmeasurable components, right? So when you think of a leader, there's a lot of things that you can measure. So you can say, okay, you know, they, their students did this well on, on certain standardized tests or their students had a certain GPA. You know, there's, there's measurable components of leadership. But then there's unmeasurable components that deal with issues like how you make people feel, how you motivated them, how you help them to improve. These are some of the kind of the unmeasurable components of leadership that a lot of times people look over, but are honestly just as important as the measurable outcomes. So one of the things that is un, you know, fortunate, unfortunate, however you want to look at it in education, a lot of times, like for example, we have school grades, right? So you go to a school and they say, well, this is a B school, 
this is a C school, this is a D school, this is a whatever school, right? So that grade is the measurement for what is happening in that school. That's not necessarily reflective of the effort of the teachers, the effort of the administrators, the efforts of the staff work at the school is not always reflective, right? So sometimes a lot of the progress and the great work you've done, it doesn't go measured, it's not measured, but you're still a good leader in spite of the fact that maybe you won't get the recognition that you probably deserve. So there are four keys to, to, for being an effective leader. The first is being able to clearly articulate the vision and the purpose of your actions, all right? So, you know, sometimes uh, when, when we grow up, our parents say, because I said so, or just cause, you know, they don't, they don't really, they didn't really necessarily like to explain. So a lot, of, a lot of us have derived our leadership style from our parents or our elders who come from an era where, you know, you didn't really have to explain things to people. You just told them to do something and then they just did it because that's how it's always been done or because someone who was older than you said so. However, you know, as a leader, that's not always the most effective way to go about doing things, right? What you really wanna be able to do is you really wanna be able to explain to people exactly what you want and then not only what, 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 what you want, but also why you want that, right? Because when people understand the purpose, if there's any variations, any deviations, they can, they can adapt a lot better because they understand the vision and the overall purpose of what you're trying to do. So that's, that's number one. Number two is to be able to gain buy-in from those you lead and aligning interests and objectives. So again, we are, when you're a leader, you want the people who you are leading to buy into what you're doing, right? So for example, I don't know, you know, a lot of us probably are football fans or sports fans. When you hear coaches talking, they talk about people buying into the system, believing in the system and doing their job. That's one thing Bill Belichick, you know, the coach of the New England Patriots, he talks about that all the time. His favorite saying is do your job, right? And what he means by that is that all you need to do is what we told you to do. And if everyone does what he tells you to do, then the system will work, right? And that's what we call buy-in. Because when one person starts doing something that they're not supposed to do, then the entire system st starts not working because you're not getting the buy-in. And one of the main reasons why a lot of times you don't get buy-in when, when, uh, from the people that you're leading is because you haven't effectively aligned interests and objectives. All right, so that's something that, 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 that is very important to understand. So what, what do I mean by aligning interests and objectives? So you want, like for, for example, I'll just use a simple example. If you're in sales, right, and let's say you get paid based on commission. So if you get paid based on commission, then, you're, then you selling items is gonna bring profit into the company, and in that profit, you're gonna get a share of that profit, right? So that person's interests are aligned with that of the company. Now, let's take it on the other hand. Let's say you're getting paid $8 an hour and you're getting paid $8 an hour no matter how much you sell, then your interest is not necessarily aligned with the profit of the company, right? So, so what you'll find is like, for example, you go to a fast food restaurant, right? And it's, you know, let's say they close at 10 o'clock. At 9.30, they're shutting down, they're stopping because a lot of the people who work there their interest is not really tied to the profit, overall profitability of the company, right? They're just ready to go home because they've already worked and they're not gonna make any more money if you make additional sales. So that, that's kind of like, uh, this is kind of a brief example of that and we can kind of talk more in detail about that later. The third thing is being able to stay consistent or make adjustments when challenges come your way, right? So a lot of times as a leader, you might say, okay, I wanna do this, I want to do this this way, and then all of a sudden, bam, here comes a lot of challenges, right? Or here comes a lot of things that you did not anticipate, right? So a lot of times you may want to say, all right, I'm just going to give up and quit, or I'm going to change things or whatever. But ultimately, the majority of the time when you're a leader, it's about staying consistent and, 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 and sticking to your purpose and your overall vision. These are things that are very important. When you do need to make adjustments, it's, it's very important that those adjustments are measured and calculated and they still align with the overall vision and purpose. So there are definitely times you need to make adjustments as a leader, but you want to make sure that those adjustments are in line with the overall vision and purpose that we talked about in the first objective. Number four is being able to take credit and also blame for the outcomes of your decision. 
right? So one of the things that a lot of people who are leaders don't like to do is accept blame, right? So, so when you're a leader uh, and you mess up, a lot of times you like to blame your subordinates or blame someone else or say, well, if they did this and did that, things would have came out differently. However, a strong leader can say, hey, listen, I messed up. Um, you know, I thought, I thought this was going to happen. It didn't happen. And this is what happened. And now here's, here's how we're going to move forward, right? There's no shame. There's no uh, problem with, you know, being wrong. And I think that's one thing that, that a lot of people have felt, feel vulnerable in their leadership roles because they feel like if I make a mistake, then, my lead, then the people who I'm leading are not going to respect me anymore. And that's not always true, right? Now, of course, if you're consistently messing up and consistently making mistakes, you may lose a little credibility. However, you know, being able to have the humility to admit when you're wrong goes a long way. And also not being afraid to take credit for when you do a good job, all right? So a lot of times people are taught to be humble and, you know, not, you know, kind of pat themselves on the back or toot their own horn. But you also have to do that as well, especially in this era, right? A lot of people, if they don't know what you've done, if you don't say what you've done, there's no way for them to know what you've done. So you have to tell people about your successes. You have to tell people about the great things that you've done because ultimately it leads to people properly giving you the credit that you deserve. So these are the, these are the four, four keys uh, for effective leadership. All right. So in particular, to get kind of more specific on education, why is educational leadership challenging, right? One of the main things that makes leadership in the educational field challenging is that you have to deal with a lot of public scrutiny, right? These, these are usually public institutions, whether it's a university, whether it's a high school, middle school, elementary school. Generally speaking, these are public institutions, meaning that anything that happens could be public record, right? Or you could be criticized publicly, you could be criticized, um, you know, in the newspaper, on TV, any of those things can happen. So in most professions, you don't have to deal with that type of scrutiny, right? However, in education, there is a lot of public scrutiny. Also, a lot of people don't understand the day-to-day -day challenges of teaching. Now, that's slightly starting to change now, right? Now that a lot of people are educating their kids at home, people are starting to realize, hey, this teaching thing ain't easy, right? It's hard. It's hard to teach. It's hard to, you know, manage a classroom. It's, it's hard. To, a lot of things we do are very challenging, but it seems simple, right? So some people will say, well, you know, teachers, you know, they only, they get the summers off, they get winter breaks, they get spring breaks, you know, and in the average working world, that's not normal. But what people don't realize is that a lot of times that we spend during breaks are planning, are putting together lessons, and just decompressing from the level of stress that we have to deal with that most people don't have to deal with. Right? Most people are, are, are not able to, or don't have the skill set to be able to deal with, you know, maybe young kids all day or even high school kids or middle school kids all day. Um, it, it can be quite challenging to, to, to operate in that environment and also have a lot of pressure to have good outcomes. So a lot of people don't understand that. Another thing that's very difficult, and I think that we've seen this over the last, you know, over the last six or so months, is a lot of changing criteria. You know, at first, when COVID first came out, we didn't know, okay, are we going to be online? Are we going to be in person? Are we going to be doing a hybrid version? You know, we don't know, all right? So outside of just the COVID environment, that is a norm. You know, there's always different objectives because, you know, a lot of times the state legislatures will meet or the school board will meet and they'll say, well, look, we want to do this differently. We want to use this test. We want to use this metric. So things change so often in education that, it's very, very hard to kind of steer the ship straight forward because you're always having a different goal. Um, another thing is there's a, lar a large amount of turnover. And that's actually going to be, I believe, possibly going to be exacerbated over the next couple of years. There are teachers have a high burnout rate, right? And the reason why is because, you know, you have a lot of people who weren't necessarily trained as educators who kind of came into the field or some people use teaching as a transitional stage in their life until they can get to something else. Um, so you, have, you just have a lot of turnover, especially when you get into certain schools. Certain schools have new teachers, you know, 10, 12 new teachers every year, some even more, right? So because of that large amount of turnover, when you're, when you're a leader, that can be very challenging. Also, you have a lot of changes in leadership in terms of principals, assistant principals. You know, there's just a lot of, lot of movement in leadership and that, that, that constant turnover can be a challenge. 
Another thing is the inconsistent qualification standard. So I kind of alluded to that before when I said that, you know, for you, for, for you guys who are going through the program, you know, you're taking the GK, you're taking the subject area test, you're taking all these classes in education that are training you and teaching you how to be a teacher. However, there, there are other people who, who, who will become teachers who haven't gone through any of that type of training, right? So they're gonna show up, you know, um, to teach in the spring or in, you know, in the fall without any of the same qualifications that you may have, right? So because of that inconsistent qualification standard, you have a lot of different outcomes and performances of teachers because they're not held to the same standard, right? So like, unlike lawyers where you gotta pass the LSAT, or there's, you know, a lot of other criteria, you know, the, the, the criteria to become a teacher is, is, is very lax. It has been very lax. And the reason why it's very lax is because there's an extreme shortage of teachers, right? And we expect that to be even worse over the next year or so. So how do you develop the leader in you, right? So what, what I've found over time is that leadership comes from confidence, all right? And confidence comes from experience and preparation. So, you know, cer certain components of experience, you know, you just have to keep living. And as you live more, you'll have more experience. But when you're young, what you can do is try to be as prepared as possible, all right? So you can do a lot of reading, a lot of studying. You can talk to older people. You can talk to people with more experience in the field. That helps you with your preparation. Because the best thing in life is to learn from other people's experience rather than your own, right? Because we have an infinite amount of time in life, right? So you may, you know, you may live 70 years, 60 years, however many years. However, you can talk to an infinite amount of people and gain all of those years of experience just by reaching out and talking to different people. Another thing you want to do is you want to track the outcomes of your decisions. So when you do something as a leader, what happened? Right? So you want to make sure you keep a good track of what happens with your decisions. And then also when you, when you, vary, when you make variations, also compare the outcome. So if I did something this way one semester and then I changed it and did it this way that semester, I want to be able to compare those two to see which is the best way going forward. Right? So data is a very important thing in, in all of our lives now, but it's very important in measuring and tracking your progress as a leader. Another thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you read consistently and ask questions. So there's a lot of books out there about leadership, about your specific discipline or whatever. You want to be reading constantly, consistently throughout your career as an educator and throughout your career as a leader and always asking questions and finding out more. And then, of course, one of the best ways to do it is to find mentors who are in leadership who can help you. So, you know, there's a lot of, especially, you know, through FAMU, there's so many teachers who come out of FAMU who are in the field, who are principals, who are on the school board, who are just whatever level of uh, the profession that you aspire to be in or that you're currently in, there's always an alum from FAMU that you can reach out to that would be more than willing to help you. So innovation. So, you know, when we talk about innovation, and, and, and this is kind of a little more hands-on or a little more technical part about it, you know, it's a lot more challenging than leadership, right? Because when you start to innovate, that's when you have to start thinking outside the box. That's when you have to start doing the thing that a lot of people have, a lot of people struggle doing. You have to understand how things can be instead of how they are, right? So a lot of us will say, you know, on our job, look, man, this is how it is, this is how it's always been. That's it, right? An innovator thinks about how things can be and puts steps in place to get there, right? So you have to escape that mindset of sticking with traditions, especially if those outcomes aren't desirable. So, so a lot of you guys, you know, may end up teaching in, you know, schools that, that aren't performing well or may end up leading organizations or entities that aren't performing well. Well, if you want to change things, you can't keep doing things the same way, right? You can't just keep beating, beating a dead horse and beating a dead horse and things are going to come back to life. It's going to lay there dead in, in, in perpetuity until you start doing things a little bit differently. So let me speak specifically today about technology, right? Now, here's what was interesting about technology. Technology was created to make our lives easier. It was created to give people a higher quality of life. It was created to connect people, to help people to connect better. And every time our society fights against technology's original purpose, they lose, 
right? So I'll just give you a very simple example, right? When I was in school, Facebook was banned from FAMU, right? So if you went to FAMU's library, you could not get on Facebook, right? You couldn't log on, anything like that, right? But Facebook was so powerful that, you know, a few years later when I came back and started working at the university, the university had a Facebook page, right? So just imagine in the, you know, I would say three or four year time frame, the university went from banning Facebook use at all on campus to having a Facebook page and using it to promote what's happened at the university, right? And you see now how much the university and all universities rely on Facebook. So it just shows you that you cannot fight against technology in its original purpose because you'll always lose, right? Technology is undefeated. Um, and we're in one of those moments right now, right? Where technology is, is, is really uh, penetrating the field of education in ways that it never has. And we have to do it right if we're gonna, if we're gonna win um, in the long run. So one of the negatives that we're seeing right now and I'm pointing this out because I believe this is going to be an opportunity for a lot of you guys, is that we have a lot of non-native technology users who are in leadership positions right now, right? So what I mean by that, and it's not necessarily based on someone's age or someone's, you know, uh, background. I mean, it can be tied to that. However, it's really about do they understand, do they understand technology? And what's happening now in a lot of workplaces and a lot of environments is that you have non-native technology users who are using technology to reinforce toxic work cultures and habits, right? Excessive meetings, excessively long meetings, overstepping people's work life, personal balances, you know, a lot of different things like that. A lot of that's happening right now. Uh, you, you'll see, you know, as we kind of transition through out of the emergency stage of, of, the, uh, of, 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 the, of the pandemic, what you're gonna see is that a lot of people are gonna be complaining about being overworked, about work, home boundaries being, you know, blurred, things like that. Because, and a lot of people are using technology, not in a positive way, actually in a negative way, all right? So with distance learning, you know, we kind of, we're dealing with this a lot, right? So now some of us are teaching from our home, right? And so you think, okay, I'm teaching from home, you know, so what happens if I have a problem with my Wi-Fi? What happens if I have a, a maintenance issue at my house? You know, am I supposed to tell the repairman not to come because I got to teach my class. Like, this is a lot of little, little things that we never thought about, right, that, that we may have to deal with. And then also things about, like, asynchronous work times. Like, for, so, for example, if I'm working from home, do I still need to work 9 to 5? Or can I work, you know, 9 to 12 and then work maybe 7 to midnight? I don't know. You know, these are just different things that you think about, right? So the policies and procedures are being, are, are, that, that are being uh, developed, if they, if, if they eliminate uh, the original intent of technology, which is to make your life easier and to make your life more enjoyable, to connect people better, then it's going to keep education from its natural evolution, right? So these are just things that, that we need to think about. So when you're leading, you need to always understand the why behind technology and you have to be the one, those are going to be the people who are going to lead in the future. So the people who understand the purpose behind technology of making people's life easier, of connecting people better, of, you know, giving people access to way more information. When you understand that why, then you're going to be a much better leader, right? So what you have to do is you have to start creating new ways of doing things and new ways of measuring outcomes. So in the past, like I'll just give, just give an example, right? So in the past, you had a lot of memorization was a lot of, lot of testing people. So, you know, you would ask someone, okay, you know, what year did this happen? Or what is, you know, five times six? And, you know, you would do all these things manually, right? But now you have computer programs that do all of these things. So what is the point of making someone memorize these things when they can sit right in front of the computer and just type, type it in, right? So, you know, these are things that, so now as educators, we have to think of, okay, how can we test people differently? How can we create critical thinking questions? How can we create discussion questions? How can we create new ways of doing things that ultimately at the end of the day will, um, you know, lead to better learning outcomes? So one of the things that we want to do is we want to, we want to create more flexibility and less one size fit all approaches. All right. So now, you know, if, if we're learning from home, everyone's in a different environment. Everyone has different, you know, internet bandwidth. Everyone has different, you know, things are different. 
So we can't adopt a one size fit all policy. when We know that people are operating in totally different environments. Also, we need to have a culture of adaptability within organizations where we say, okay, look, we thought this was the best way to do it. However, now that we've seen this isn't the best way to do it. So we're gonna have to change a little bit, right? So these type of things when you're a leader are very important and very, very, very critical. All right. So just to kind of, you know, sum things up about why leaders succeed, right? So the main reason why leaders succeed is that they communicate and they also listen, right? It's very, very important to listen to, to, to the people that you're leading. Listen to their input, listen to what they have to say, listen to a lot of different things that, 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 that they have to talk about because you can learn so much from the people that you're leading, right? So as a teacher, you'll find you learn a lot from your students, right? As a principal, you learn a lot from your teachers. As, you know, a, a superintendent or, you know, upper level administrator, you learn a lot from principals, right? You just learn from people all, all up and down the line. Learning is a very, you know, circular uh, uh, event where it can come from any different place, all right? Another good thing is, being able to bring people together, right? So you're going to be working in environments with a lot of different people or teaching in an environment with a lot of different people. You need to be able to bring those people together and bring them together for the common good. You want to be great at articulating the why of things. So why are things being done the way they're doing? Especially now, you know, people are very concerned with the whys nowadays. Like I said, like I was saying earlier in the presentation, you know, in previous generations, it was considered rude to ask someone older than you why or, you know, ask certain questions because it was almost seen as you were challenging them, right? But now in the, in the, in the era of so much information and people having so much ac access to technology and information, people wanna know why. Um, and it's very important to be able to articulate that. Again, the people who embrace the original intent of technology, which is to make our life easier, to make our life more enjoyable, to connect people better, those are people who are gonna lead in the future, right? The people who use technology to overwork people, to have excessive amounts of meetings, to have you know, a lot of redundant activities, those organizations are gonna bleed employees. Those organizations are gonna bleed people left and right because people aren't gonna, work, aren't gonna wanna work for them. They're not, they're not gonna wanna be led by those type of people. Um, and also just creating new systems and ways of um, accomplishing outcomes, right? So we have to innovate, we have to change the way we do things. We can't just stick to the same you know, same old same, even post COVID after we kind of go back to the quote unquote normal, or whatever that whatever that may be, we're still gonna need a lot of new systems and a lot of new ways of accomplishing things. All right, so I'll go ahead and, and, and stop there and pause there. Um, if people have some questions for me, um, you can check out my, my website. Also, you can check out, you know, you can shoot me an email. And of course, you know, I'm ready for a, a Q and A now. So any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniels. Thank you. I have a, a response, Doc. Great job, number one. Um, Thank you. you know, leadership is my piece. Uh, yeah. So my question to you is, um, how do you feel or what do you think in terms of our new students as they matriculate? Um, what are some of the things that they need to learn now in order to be uh, prepared in a digital world as we um, continue to go through this process? This. Right. So I, I would say the number one thing is learning digital networking. That, that is very hard for a lot of people. Um, so, so previously, you know, you would go to a career fair, you would meet the recruiter at the career fair, and then you give them your resume, and then you get a job. I mean, that's, you know, it's very easy, you know, straightforward. But now these digital career fairs, those are some of the weirdest, you know, just not non-native things. They're just very abnormal, right? Because, you know, we have to, we have to always realize, right? there's something called the art of attraction, right? So it may not be, you know, you know we talk about attraction, not necessarily boyfriend, girlfriend, or, you know, dating attraction, but there's an attraction that you draw from people naturally from in-person interaction, right? When you remove that and you have to do it digitally, this is very, it's a very, very awkward environment, right? So, you know, even now, you know, when, when you're talking on Zoom or this, that, and the other, you know, I already know you guys, so it's like, you know, we know each other, so it's fine. But if this was us meeting for the first time, it would be slightly awkward, like, because you've never seen me before. You don't know me. You know, it's just, it's just very different. So being able to navigate getting a job or getting an internship or even getting a mentor 
in a digital environment is very difficult, right? So I would say work on that from the beginning. But here's the upside. The downside is difficult, but the upside is you have access to anyone in the world, right? So now, you know, it used to be like, okay, I go to the, you know, the, the FAMU ed Department of, you know, Education or, you know, College Education, Career Fair, it'd be a bunch of people from all throughout Florida, maybe, you know, Georgia, you know, mainly regional. Um, but now I mean, you can get on and find someone who's teaching in Japan and Taiwan. So there's an upside to it, but the upside is the initial meeting is a little bit more awkward. But once you get past that, you'll be successful. So before um, COVID, I would tell my students to uh, get on to LinkedIn. I was, I'm still a big fan of LinkedIn. Um, now, more than ever, that digital platform is going to be so um, critical to having the students uh, connect with people, as you stated, not just in a, on a regional level, but around the world. So I love that comment. Thank you. I want to go. I want to go back to that and hammer that home one more time. <laughs> yes, sir. If you spend it, if you're spending more time on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook than LinkedIn, you ain't serious about getting money. That's right. right. You're not serious. L LinkedIn literally is is a blessing from God or from whoever from above, right? It, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it, it's a it's it is literally a blessing because it is literally the only social media site that was created from the beginning for the purpose of professional networking, right? So I would encourage every single person, get a professional picture, get a professional profile, set up LinkedIn. If you don't do, if you don't do anything, uh, you, know, you know, you may pick and choose what you wanna listen to. If you don't do anything, create a LinkedIn profile because that right there is gonna lead to so many opportunities because every day on LinkedIn, as you scroll through your feed, you'll find somebody posting a job. Every single day I see a job on LinkedIn or a, a fellowship or some other opportunity. And as a professional person, that's where you sh sh should be spending the majority of your time is trying to find professional opportunities and networking because that'll help you traject throughout your entire career. And it, it also broadens your um, professional network, right? Because there may be people say, you know, Dr. Daniels is um, in education. I'm in education. Mr. Moise is in education. But Dr. Daniels may know someone who's looking for somebody like me, who's a historian of medicine, to write a curriculum for something, right? But if I were not on LinkedIn, I just wouldn't know that that person is looking for that. Um, Dr. Daniels was really modest about um, a lot of the other work that he's involved in, in terms of kind of like community activism, uh, also in terms of some of his other uh, kind of political engagement work. So he's really connected um, in a lot of spaces and not just locally, uh, but literally around the world, right? So uh, you want to make sure that you're taking this time to really engage with him because we're really fortunate uh, for him to be spending um, this time with us because he is a very um, busy person and engaged in a lot of different enterprises. So do we have any other questions um, from students who um, may, may have some more kind of follow-up about those leadership skills uh, that you would need or, or the ideas of adaptation in terms of education and leadership? I have a question. Yes. Um, I was just wondering what, you, so, you were saying, you know, you can lead, you can become a leader basically anywhere you put yourself as long as, you know, you have the mindset for the situation that you're in. But if you are in a situation where you feel like you can't really be the leader you want to be, would you recommend going and finding opportunities elsewhere or trying to create some where you are? Yeah, I mean, it, that, so, so that, that is difficult, right? So sometimes the organization that you're within there's not an opportunity for leadership or maybe the, the opportunity for leadership you don't want, right? Because there's certain entities and organizations that you may or may not want to continue to work for. Um, so yeah, I mean, every, every leader has that challenge. That, that is something that drives a lot of people into entrepreneurship, that drives a lot of people into consulting, right? So I'm, I'm speaking specifically on education. Um, so let's say, for example, you may say, okay, you know, I've been a teacher for four or five years now. I don't know if I want to be a principal, all right? So some people end up just, or I don't want to teach, they may not want to teach anymore. So they may say, okay, maybe I'll be an educational consultant or maybe I'll do, you know, some other things. So 
you can go the entrepreneurship route if you feel like, okay, this isn't for me uh, at this particular institution, or you could try another place that may be a better, better fit for the culture, for, for your culture and what you're looking for. Um, I would definitely suggest the best thing to do in those type of situations is to get some advice from, you wanna get advice from two different, two different types of people, right? Some people who are older, but then also some people who are kind of in your same kind of age range who are a little bit more advanced than you, right? Now, l l let me explain why. Previous generations of people are very adverse to changing jobs because like they grew up in an environment where you worked the same place for 50 years, you retired there, you know, th that was the world that they grew up in, right? That's not necessarily the world that we're in now, right? So for a lot of people, they're like, you know, for like my parents or something, for me to say, you know, I want to get a new job, that sounds ridiculous. They're just like, wait a minute, why you just want to stay there? You know, th that sounds outrageous to them, changing jobs and this type of stuff. But, they, you know, our, our, this generation that we're in now, the fluidity of people is a lot different. That's why you should talk to people because what you're finding now is that a lot of people, instead of climbing the corporate ladder, are making lateral moves. So work here three years, make a lateral move, but a little bit higher a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And then, you know, they're finding a lot more career success that way. So that's why I would suggest kind of talking to a few different people. So people who kind of have done the company route and been in place for 30 years, 40 years. And then some people who are, I was there three years, I was there three years, I was there three years, and kind of get their perspective and that, that'll help you along the way. I think it was another question. Yeah, in the chat, you have uh, Kamaria. How would you recommend using LinkedIn to its full potential being first, I think she was being a first or second year college student. She's one of our new LLC members. Okay, great. So uh, first thing I would do is create a profile on LinkedIn. Um, and then I would go and try to, you know, look up FAMU alums or teachers like Leon County teachers or, you know, people who are teachers in the area. And then I would just reach out to a couple people and ask them if they would, you know, if you could be their mentor or if they could, they could mentor you or you could be their, you know, um, if, if they can work with you. Say, listen, I'm an aspiring teacher. Um, I'm looking for a mentor. I'm looking to, you know, work, 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 work with the teacher who's, you know, been around and has some experience and just kind of reach out and ask people to, if, if they want to mentor you. That, that's really the best way. I know it, it can be a little bit awkward, you know, but really, you know, it's not really that hard. So, I mean, I, I would be happy to help anybody, you know, with my email and stuff is on here. I'd be, I'd be glad to help people. Like if you need to be connected to like some teachers or connected to some principals or whoever, whoever you want to be connected with, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to help you. We can connect on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is just my name, Christopher Daniels. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, just following, you need to follow the people who are in your industry. So just like, just like you get on, uh, you know, Instagram and you follow like the popular people, the same thing on LinkedIn. So if I'm a teacher, you know, I want to get on there and follow teachers. I want to follow principals. I want to follow, you know, people who are in my industry. And then what will happen is what LinkedIn, what LinkedIn does that other social media don't, doesn't do is that when they like something, it, 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 it comes up. So if Dr. Shakur, let's say we and her follow each other on, on LinkedIn, if she likes someone's picture or likes someone's whatever post, then I'll see it because she liked it. And then I'll probably find another person who's a good person for me to connect to, right? And that's how you can grow your connections. And then also, if she likes my picture or my post, then other people can see it and they can connect to me as well. So LinkedIn, it takes a little bit of time to kind of like learn it. But once you learn how the algorithms, algorithms work, it's very, very, very effective um, and a great way to meet people. And I, I do believe, um, Mr. Moyes, if I'm not mistaken, that you are requiring all students as a part of your class to create a LinkedIn, right? That is correct. Right. So, so uh, one of the things that I want them to do is actually connect with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Daniels, as well as uh, Dr. Shakira and myself. Um, again, it is a great networking tool. So um, definitely take advantage of it. Yeah, you know, I mean, and you know, sometimes, you know, and this is, you know, having a, a little real talk. Sometimes when like your professors make you do something, you're like, oh, I want to do it. Oh, I want to do it. But I'm telling you, listen, uh, like I said. They're lame. 
Trust me on this. Trust me on this one. You know, so maybe sometimes we, we, we might be a little bit off. But on this one, I promise you, it's a home run. LinkedIn is a home run. You will get to where you want. If you spend, if you spend even half as much time on LinkedIn as you spend on Instagram or Twitter or, or whatever, you know, TikTok, whatever you want, I promise you, you'll get exactly where you want to go. You'll be connected to all the people you need to be connected with. The doors of opportunities will really open for you. So please, if you don't listen to nothing else, do that. And you already have your ring light and all your other accoutrements that you need to make a nice uh, professional photograph. And that's something else we'll be talking about um, in our forums when we have our next forum on October 22nd, um, where we'll bring recruiters and people who look to intern, uh, have you as interns. Any other questions for Dr. Daniels? Any other questions? Anybody want to chat or... Um, any other questions? Okay, we don't have any other questions. Well, that was my little slide for questions. Um, but uh, uh, this is our social media. Most of you are hopefully familiar. Am I sharing my screen or no? You're not. <laughs> okay, I figured that was happening. That's what Dr. Daniels was talking about, about our... Um, our um, adaptability <laughs> with, with social media. Uh, Phoenix put in the chat, uh, thank you, Dr. Daniels, for sharing your time with us. Uh, thank thank. I, I always appreciate it. You know, it's always a pleasure to talk to my fellow College of Ed alone. I want to see all y'all be successful. Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay, so our social media, we are at FAMU underscore COE. Um, in every single place where social media is available.